This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording by Tina. Beauty and the Beast by Marie Le Prince de Beaumont. There once was a very rich merchant who had six children, three sons, and three daughters. Being a man of sense, he spared no cost for their education, but gave them all kinds of masters. His daughters were extremely handsome, especially the youngest. When she was little, everybody admired her and called her the Little Beauty, so that as she grew up she still went by the name of Beauty, which made her sisters very jealous. The youngest, as she was handsome, was also better than her sisters. The two eldest had a great deal of pride because they were rich. They gave themselves ridiculous airs, and would not visit other merchants' daughters, nor keep company with any but persons of quality. They went out every day upon parties of pleasure, balls, plays, concerts, etc., and laughed at their youngest sister, because she spent the greatest part of her time in reading good books. As it was known that they were to have great fortunes, several eminent merchants made their addresses to them, but the two eldest said they would never marry unless they could meet with a duke or an earl at least. Beauty very civilly thanked them that courted her, and told them that she was too young yet to marry, but chose to stay with her father a few years longer. All at once the merchant lost his whole fortune, excepting a small country house at a great distance from town, and told his children, with tears in his eyes, they must go there and work for their living. The two eldest answered that they would not leave the town, for they had several lovers who they were sure would be glad to have them, though they had no fortune. But in this they were mistaken, for their lovers slighted and forsook them in their poverty. As they were not beloved on account of their pride, everybody said, They do not deserve to be pitied. We are glad to see their pride humbled. Let them go and give themselves quality airs in milking the cows and minding their dairy. But, added they, we are extremely concerned for beauty. She was such a charming, sweet-tempered creature, spoke so kindly to poor people, and was of such an affable, obliging disposition. Nay, several gentlemen would have married her, though they knew she had not a penny, but she told them she could not think of leaving her poor father and his misfortunes, but was determined to go along with him into the country to comfort and attend him. Poor Beauty at first was sadly grieved at the loss of her fortune. But, she said to herself, were I to cry ever so much, that would not make things better. I must try to make myself happy without a fortune." When they came to their country house, the merchant and his three sons applied themselves to husbandry and tillage, and Beauty rose at four in the morning and made haste to have the house clean and breakfast ready for the family. In the beginning she found it very difficult, for she had not been used to work as a servant, but in less than two months she grew stronger and healthier than ever. After she had done her work, she read, played on the harpsichord, or else sung while she spun. On the contrary, her two sisters did not know how to spend their time. They got up at ten, and did nothing but saunter about the whole day, lamenting the loss of their fine clothes and acquaintance. "'Do but see our youngest sister,' said they one to the other. "'What a poor, stupid, mean-spirited creature she is, to be contented with such an unhappy situation!' The good merchant was of a quite different opinion. He knew very well that beauty outshone her sisters, in her person as well as her mind, and admired her humility, industry, and patience for her sisters not only left all the work of the house to do, but insulted her every moment. The family had lived about a year in this retirement, when the merchant received a letter, with an account that a vessel, on board of which he had effects, was safely arrived. This news had liked to turn the heads of the two eldest daughters, who immediately flattered themselves with the hopes of returning to town, for they were quite weary of a country life, and when they saw their father ready to set out, they begged of him to buy them new gowns, caps, rings, and all manner of trifles. But Beauty asked for nothing, for she thought to herself that all the money her father was going to receive would scarce be sufficient to purchase everything her sisters wanted. "'What will you have, Beauty?' said her father. "'Since you are so kind as to think of me,' answered she, "'be so kind as to bring me a rose, for as none grow hereabouts they are a kind of rarity.' Not that Beauty cared for a rose, but she asked for something, lest she should seem by her example to condemn her sister's conduct, who would have said that she did it only to look particular. The good man went on his journey, but when he came there they went to law with him about the merchandise, 
and after a great deal of trouble and pains to no purpose, he came back as poor as before. He was within thirty miles of his own house, thinking on the pleasure he should have in seeing his children again, when going through a large forest he lost himself. It rained and snowed terribly, besides the wind was so high that it threw him twice off his horse. And night coming on he began to apprehend either being starved to death with cold and hunger, or else devoured by the wolves whom he heard howling all around him, when, on a sudden, looking through a long walk of trees, he saw a light at some distance and going on a little farther, perceived that it came from a palace illuminated from top to bottom. The merchant returned God thanks for this happy discovery, and hastened to the palace, but was greatly surprised at not meeting with anyone in the outcourts. His horse followed him, and, seeing a large stable open, went in and finding both hay and oats, the poor beast, who was almost famished, fell to eating very heartily. The merchant tied him up to the manger and walked toward the house, where he saw no one, but entering into a large hall he found a good fire, and a table plentifully set out, with but one cover laid. As he was wet quite through with the rain and snow, he drew near the fire to dry himself. "'I hope,' said he, "'the master of the house or his servants will excuse the liberty I take. I suppose it will not be long before some of them appear.' He waited a considerable time, till it struck eleven, and still nobody came. At last he was so hungry that he could stay no longer, but took a chicken and ate it in two mouthfuls, trembling all the while. After this he drank a few glasses of wine, and growing more courageous he went out of the hall and crossed through several grand apartments with magnificent furniture, till he came into a chamber which had an exceeding good bed in it, and as he was very much fatigued and it was past midnight, he concluded it was best to shut the door and go to bed. It was ten the next morning before the merchant waked, and as he was going to rise he was astonished to see a good suit of clothes in the room of his own, which were quite spoiled. Certainly, said he, this palace belongs to some kind fairy who has seen and pitied my distress. He looked through a window, but instead of snow saw the most delightful arbors, interwoven with the most beautiful flowers that ever were beheld. He then returned to the great hall where he had supped the night before and found some chocolate ready-made on a little table. "'Thank you, good Madame Fairy,' said he aloud, "'for being so careful as to provide me a breakfast. "'I am extremely obliged to you for all your favors.' The good man drank his chocolate, and then went to look for his horse. But passing through an arbor of roses, he remembered Beauty's request to him, and gathered a branch on which were several. Immediately he heard a great noise, and saw such a frightful beast coming towards him that he was ready to faint away. "'You are very ungrateful,' said the beast to him in a terrible voice. "'I have saved your life by receiving you into my castle, "'and in return you steal my roses, "'which I value beyond anything in the universe, "'but you shall die for it. "'I give you but a quarter of an hour to prepare yourself to say your prayers.' "'The merchant fell on his knees and lifted up both his hands. "'My lord,' said he, "'I beseech you to forgive me.' Indeed, I had no intention to offend in gathering a rose for one of my daughters, who desired me to bring her one. "'My name is not my lord,' replied the monster, "'but beast. I don't love compliments, not I. I like people should speak as they think, so do not imagine I am to be moved by any of your flattering speeches. But you say you've got daughters. I will forgive you on condition that one of them come willingly and suffer for you.' Let me have no words, but go about your business, and swear that if your daughter refuse to die in your stead, you will return within three months. The merchant had no mind to sacrifice his daughters to the ugly monster, but he thought in obtaining this respite he should have the satisfaction of seeing them once more, so he promised upon oath he would return, and the beast told him he might set out when he pleased. But, added he, you shall not depart empty-handed. Go back to the room where you lay, and you will see a great empty chest. Fill it with whatever you like best, and I will send it to your home. And at the same time, Beast withdrew. Well, said the good man to himself, if I must die, I shall have the comfort at least of leaving something to my poor children. He returned to the bedchamber, and finding a great quantity of broad pieces of gold, he filled the great chest the Beast had mentioned locked it, and afterwards took his horse out of the stable, leaving the palace 
with as much grief as he had entered it with joy. The horse, of his own accord, took one of the roads of the forest, and in a few hours the good man was at home. His children came around him, but instead of receiving their embraces with pleasure, he looked on them, and holding up the branch he had in his hands, he burst into tears. "'Here, beauty,' said he, "'take these roses, but little do you think how dear they are like to cost your unhappy father.' and then related his fatal adventure. Immediately the two eldest set up lamentable outcries, and said all manner of ill-natured things to Beauty, who did not cry at all. "'Do but see the pride of that little wretch,' said they. "'She would not ask for fine clothes as we did, but no, truly, Miss wanted to distinguish herself, so now she will be the death of our poor father, and yet she does not so much as shed a tear.' And "'Why should I?' answered Beauty. It would be very needless, for my father shall not suffer upon my account. Since the monster will accept one of his daughters, I will deliver myself up to all his fury, and I am very happy in thinking that my death will save my father's life, and be a proof of my tender love for him. No, sister, said her three brothers, that shall not be. We will go find the monster, and either kill him or perish in the attempt. Do not imagine any such thing, my sons, said the merchant. Beast's power is so great that I have no hopes of your overcoming him. I am charmed with Beauty's kind and generous offer, but I cannot yield to him. I am old, and have not long to live, so can lose only a few years, which I regret, for your sakes alone, my dear children. Indeed, father, said Beauty, you shall not go to the palace without me. You cannot hinder me from following you. It was to no purpose. All they could say, Beauty still insisted on setting out for the fine palace and her sisters were delighted at it, for her virtue and amiable qualities made them envious and jealous. The merchant was so afflicted at the thoughts of losing his daughter that he had quite forgot the chest full of gold. But at night, when he retired to rest, no sooner had he shut his chamber door than, to his great astonishment, he found the chest of gold by his bedside. He was determined, however, not to tell his children that he was grown rich, because they would have wanted to return to town and he was resolved not to leave the country. But he trusted Beauty with the secret, who informed him that two gentlemen came in his absence and courted her sisters. She begged her father to consent to their marriage, and give them fortunes, for she was so good that she loved them, and forgave them heartily all their ill usage. These wicked creatures rubbed their eyes with an onion to force some tears when they parted with their sister, but her brothers were really concerned. Beauty was the only one who did not shed tears at parting, because she would not increase their uneasiness. The horse took the direct road to the palace, and towards evening they perceived it illuminated as at first. The horse went of himself into the stable, and the good man and his daughter came into the great hall, where they found a table splendidly served up in two covers. The merchant had no heart to eat, but Beauty endeavored to appear cheerful, sat down to table, and helped him. Afterwards, thought she to herself, Beast surely has a mind to fatten me before he eats me, since he provides such a plentiful entertainment. When they had supped, they heard a great noise, and the merchant, all in tears, bid his poor child farewell, for he thought Beast was coming. Beauty was sadly terrified at his horrid form, but she took courage as well as she could. And the monster, having asked her if she came willingly, Yes, said she, trembling. You are very good, and I am greatly obliged to you. Honest man, go your ways tomorrow morning, but never think of returning here again. Farewell, beauty. Farewell, beast, answered she, and immediately the monster withdrew. O oh, daughter, said the merchant, embracing beauty, I am almost frightened to death. Believe me, you had better go back and let me stay here. No, father, said beauty in a resolute turn. You shall set out tomorrow morning and leave me to the care and protection of Providence. They went to bed, and thought they should not close their eyes all night, but scarce were they laid down than they fell fast asleep. And Beauty dreamed a fine lady came and said to her, I am content, Beauty, with your good will. This good action of yours, in giving up your own life to save your father's, shall not go unrewarded. Beauty waked and told her father her dream and though it helped to comfort him a little, yet he could not help crying bitterly when he took leave of his dear child. 
As soon as he was gone, Beauty sat down in the great hall, and fell a-crying likewise. But as she was mistress of a great deal of resolution, she recommended herself to God, and resolved not to be uneasy the little time she had to live, for she firmly believed Beast would eat her up that night. However, she thought she might as well walk about till then, and view this fine castle which she could not help admiring. It was a delightful, pleasant place, and she was extremely surprised at seeing a door, over which was wrote, Beauty's Apartment. She opened it hastily, and was quite dazzled with the magnificent that reigned throughout. But what chiefly took up her attention was a large library, a harpsichord, and several music books. Well, said she to herself, I see they will not let my time hang heavy on my hands for want of amusement. Then she reflected, Were I but to stay here a day, there would not have been all these preparations. This consideration inspired her with fresh courage, 